Dear friends and followers, welcome back to my channel and lovely greetings from the Airbus A320 FMPT here at the TFC Aviation Campus in Essen, Germany. With me today, my dear friend and pilot colleague, Raya. Hey everyone, thanks for the warm welcome. Yes, my name is Raya. I'm a first officer on the beautiful Airbus A320. Joe and I got together for this video as we would like to explain to you how the flight controls work on a jet airliner. And we thought the best way of doing this is by comparing the fly-by-wire system of the Airbus A320 and the conventional flight controls of the Boeing 747. So Raya will be the lead in this video and I will highlight the differences of the 747 as we go along. So what are we waiting for? And let's get started. Circuit 45, cross four left. Traffic you see on the runway to your left is staying on the runway, waiting for gate. Tower is 23 north. Circuit 45. Unlike cars, airplanes move through three-dimensional space and that is why they need to be controlled in all three axes. These three axes are called pitch, tilting the nose up and down, bank, rolling the wings, and yaw, moving the nose left and right. So the flight control surfaces on any airplane move the plane along these three axes. And here's how it works on the Airbus A320. In the pitch axis, the left and right elevators at the tail move the plane's nose up or down. The trimmable horizontal stabilizer, or THS, in front of the elevator trims the aircraft by adjusting the neutral position in the pitch axis. But more on the trim in a minute. Bank is controlled by the left and right ailerons, one on each wing. There are also five spoilers on each wing that have multiple functions, and the four outer spoilers assist the ailerons in roll control. A single rudder at the tail fin is responsible for your control. Thanks, Raya, for laying the foundation. Now, speaking of the flight controls, moving the airplane along the three mentioned axes is the same for the Boeing 747. We deflect the same flight control surfaces for the same action as on the Airbus A320. A big difference is the amount of surfaces. For pitch control, for example, the 747-400 has four elevator surfaces that move in parallel and one movable horizontal stabilizer. Roll control is achieved by four ailerons, one inboard and one outboard aileron on each wing, plus five spoilers on each wing. For your control, the vertical fin and stabilizer have an upper and lower rudder. And we both have leading edge flaps called slats on the Airbus 8020 and trailing edge flaps for takeoff and landing, which are technically also flight controls, but we exclude those from this video. I'll now let Raya get into the more technical side of the flight controls. So you might have heard that a lot of airplanes, including small Cessnas, gliders, and most Boeing from the 707 to the 767, have a mechanical linkage between the cockpit controls and the flight control surfaces. Meaning there is a direct physical connection between the pilot's yoke and the actuators that move the ailerons, elevator, and rudder. Correct, Raya, but there is also a hybrid version, but more on that in a minute. But onwards with my Airbus A320 flight controls, which do not work that way. Airbus uses what is called the famous fly-by-wire technology, meaning that the flight controls are electrically controlled and hydraulically moved into position. The pilot's inputs are converted to an electronic signal and then sent to multiple flight control computers. The computers interpret the pilot's input check whether it is within operational limits, and then send a signal by wire to the hydraulic actuators that move the surfaces. The resulting change in attitude is sent back to the computers as feedback. So you're saying that every flight control in an Airbus is run on fly-by-wire? No, there's always an exception to every rule. The rudder and horizontal stabilizer are also controlled mechanically, but more on that later. Let's look at the cockpit controls of the Airbus A320. The pilots fly the aircraft using a so-called side stick. It looks much like a computer joystick you have at home, but it is, of course, much more sophisticated. There is one side stick for each pilot. When one side stick is deflected, the other one stays in the neutral position, so there is no direct feedback on what the pilot flying is doing. That's why it's really important to always know who has control of the aircraft. When both pilots use their side sticks at the same time, the inputs are summed up. So when both pilots make the same input, the command gets bigger up to a certain maximum value. And when both pilots make opposite inputs, the commands cancel each other out. That's just for the theory though. There should always be only one pilot flying the plane at any given moment. 
However, in the event that both pilots operate their side stick simultaneously, an acoustic dual input signal sounds along with a warning light. How about we try that out? We have this amazing sim here, and we could give the people a bit of an introduction what it looks like. Sure. We'll now show you an in-flight situation where I'll be pilot flying, and Joe will be pilot monitoring. I will initiate a right turn, and Joe will then manipulate the side stick in the left direction. Dual input. Okay, good. Priority right. So that was pretty simple. Um, I uh, turned the side stick to the right, I went into the opposite direction, turned it to the left, and then you could hear the dual input call out. And then because Laya was a little bit unsure if I would continue doing this, she then held on to the autopilot disengage button. Is that how you call it? That's right, it's the takeover push button too. Okay, so the takeover push button, she pressed it long enough and then uh, she took over control where it then says priority right. When the autopilot is engaged, the side stick is locked in the neutral position, but can technically be disengaged by force on the stick. Oh, and for the sake of completeness, that black push button on the back of the side stick is for radio communication. Okay, Raya, I need to intervene here a little bit and talk about the conventional flight controls I operate on the Boeing 747-400. So on the 747, each pilot has a control column and a control wheel or yoke. Compared to your side stick, any movement on the control column and yoke is mechanically connected and moves in sync. But there are share outs, meaning if a yoke is jammed for whatever reason, if you apply enough force on the other yoke, the other pilot can regain full control. So any given inputs gets transferred via cables and linkages to hydraulic actuators that move the respective flight control surfaces. For instance, if I firmly pull on the yoke, a long steel cable runs via pulleys, cable tension tightness, etc., all the way through the fuselage to the back of the plane. And now here comes the tricky bit. All flight controls are so-called power assisted flight controls. Now this schematic here will give you a better understanding. So the cable of the yoke ends at this lever with its host point down here. When the cable pulls on the lever, it opens this shuttle valve. As the valve opens, hydraulic fluid is forced into the cylinder and with that moves the actuator, hence the respective flight control surface. Now also important to note is this connection here. Ever heard a Boeing pilot say, I can feel what the plane is doing? This link here is responsible for that. As you can see, the lever is also connected to the actuator, giving you direct feedback from the flight control surface. I have to be honest, this is a very simplified version. So basically speaking, my inputs are mechanically moved to the rear part of the plane or anywhere else where the respective flight controls are, and then power assisted by the hydraulic system. Hence, the hydraulic actuator moves the flight control surfaces with immediate mechanical feedback to the flight controls in the cockpit. Now, your thought might be, why didn't Boeing just place a sensor into the yoke that converts the pilot's input into an electrical signal and then send that signal via an electric cable to the hydraulic actuator and thereby save the weight for all the pulleys and cables, etc. Hence, fly-by-wire like on Raya's Airbus. That's a fantastic question, Joe. Why didn't Boeing do that? Raya, my dear, the uh, queen of the skies is nearly 20 years older than your baby bus. It was a matter of certification. The 747 was developed in the late 50s. Fly-by-wire was on the horizon, but far from being certified, meaning Boeing didn't have the resources for fly-by-wire yet and was stuck with the conventional flight controls as they did on previous models such as the 707, the 717, the 727 and the famous 737. And trust me when I say the conventional flight controls are the pride and joy of many Boeing pilots, giving Airbus much hate for being an Atari console on steroids. <laughs> but I'm getting carried away here. Back to you, Raya. <laughs> yes, before you do, another great feature the 747 does not come with is the A320 fully automatic pitch trim. The trim wheel moves by itself during manual flight or when the autopilot is engaged, but it can always be moved manually too. On ground, for example, we manually set takeoff pitch trim position by moving the trim wheel. For rudder control, 
there are two pairs of pedals. The left and right pedals are, in fact, interconnected. So one pilot can feel what the other one is doing. During normal operation, we don't use the rudder pedals in flight. On the ground, we use them to steer left and right. And for sharper turns, we use this thing called the tiller that deflects the nose gear in the direction we want to go. So you're basically saying you're flying just with the side stick? Yeah, you could say that. But I remember from my Airbus A320 rating many moons back that it takes quite a few flight control computers to manage all the automation, right? So let's take a closer look at the flight control computers I mentioned earlier. The flight control computers interpret the side stick inputs made by the pilots and cause the hydraulic actuators to move the flight control surfaces. They are, among other tasks, also responsible for turn coordination. That means that a turn can be flown by just deflecting the stick sideways. No rudder or pitch input is needed, as in conventional aircrafts. So just bank the plane and the computers will take care of the rest. <laughs> Convenient, right? So whenever you pitch or bank the plane, you deflect the side stick momentarily until the desired pitch or bank angle is reached. But here's the thing, once that is reached, you put the side stick back in neutral position and the aircraft will continue that exact pitch or bank. Only when you want to change that pitch or bank, let's say to stop a turn, is when you deflect the side stick again. Completely different to planes with mechanically linked flight controls. So this is one of the major differences between our two planes, or philosophies. If I bank her to the left, for example, she will bank and will want to be pitched up too to maintain altitude. But I have to physically hold the yoke in that position. But if I let go of the flight controls like you just mentioned, she will roll back to straight and level flight, like any plane with conventional flight controls would do. There's more to it. There are seven flight control computers in total. Two elevator aileron computers, or ELAX for short, three spoiler elevator computers, or SECs, and two flight augmentation computers, or FACs, that protect the rudder. So overall, you can say there is a lot of redundancy. And in the extremely unlikely case of a total failure of all flight control computers, we still have the trim wheel for pitch and the rudder for yaw. Not much, but enough to control the plane. So you're saying in the very unlikely event of the flight control computers failing, that the pitch trim and rudder are then moved mechanically, like on my Boeing? That's correct, Joe. It's the last resort. But there's one more handy function of the Airbus fly-by-wire system. There's even more? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the flight control protections. When the flight control computers work in their standard mode with no failures, called normal law, the computers can keep the plane within a safe flight envelope. That means that in normal law, it is not possible to stall the aircraft, exceed the maximum speed, apply too much pitch or bank, or create excessive g-forces. Okay, that's yet again another difference between the two. The jumbo does not have these kind of protections, no matter if the autopilot is engaged or if you are flying manually, if in the very unlikely event that you got yourself into an approach to stall, the first indication will be an ICAS caution message, airspeed air low. low. If you haven't realized your situation by now, the next will be a stall warning, depending on your altitude and configuration, either buffeting of the plane and or an artificial warning by the stick shaker, which is literally an electric motor rattling against the control column, forcing you to fly a stall recovery maneuver. So you could inadvertently fly the 747 into an approach to stall. There is no flight computer that will lower the angle of attack like on your Airbus. And I'm sure many of our viewers have heard this sound before. Bank angle, bank angle meaning you could overbank if you wanted to. So yes, we don't have the protections you have on your Airbus, meaning we have to be more vigilant about our flight control inputs and autopilot inputs. Are you saying Boeing pilots are better than Airbus pilots? Only a pilot who hasn't flown both types would say that. I have flown both and either pilot is equally great. But Joe, you might not have our flight envelope protections, but you have to have redundancy. <laughs> Yes, you might as well call her the queen of redundancies. The four hydraulic systems are, in my opinion, what makes her so reliable and redundant compared to many other aircraft of her age and class. 
Just some food for thought. Every flight control surface on the 747 is split into two and each of them is then moved by one or two hydraulic systems simultaneously. Let me give you an example with the elevator. The elevator is split into four panels, two on each side of the horizontal stabilizer. Each panel is moved by one of the four hydraulic systems. So if, for instance, there were three hydraulic system failures, you can still move the elevator and have pitch control. And for a hydraulic system to fail, a lot of things have to go wrong. Even if an engine fails, you have a hydraulic demand pump that keeps the hydraulic system going without the engine running. But more on the hydraulic system in a future comparison video. Now, Joel, you did say that there is a hybrid version too. What did you mean by that? Yes, there is. Now, my company flies the Boeing 747-8, which is the newest, but sadly also the last series of the 747. Now, the 747-8 freighter version takes off with 50 tons more than the 400, has a far more critical swept back wing than the 400, and she's five meters longer too. Now, because of these factors, Boeing came up with a hybrid solution. What I mean by that is that all flight controls are still moved conventionally and hydraulically assisted, except the ailerons. The ailerons use fly-by-wire, so there are still cables that move when you turn the yoke, but that mechanical movement is then converted into an electronic signal and then hydraulically actuated. To go into detail about that, I would have to make an entire video as there is far more to it. For example, the ailerons droop for takeoff and landing, and during turns and or engine failures, they also involve the spoilers. All of this is run via an aileron computer similar to your ELAC. And coming back to my certification statement of the fly-by-wire, just after your Airbus A320 was launched by Air France in 1988, Boeing started the development of the 777, which is the first commercial airliner of Boeing with full fly-by-wire flight controls. Now here is a, a banger question. Which non-commercial vehicle was the first to use the fly-by-wire technology? Yes, this question goes out to all the app geeks out there. May I just say that one word of the answer is already in the question? Comment below with your answer and we'll pin the first correct comment. And on that bombshell, if you have watched until now, give yourself a clap on your shoulder for taking the time to get a better understanding of flight controls on airline jets. Also, a huge thank you to TFC for allowing us to record in this wonderful A320 FNPT. Check out their website for more information on how to become a flight student at their facilities. And here's your checklist for today. Subscribe to my channel, check activate the notification bell, check follow both of our Instagram accounts, check and don't forget... <laughs> a good pilot is always learning. Wishing you all the best, your Raya and Joe. <laughs> Perfect. Woo! Yeah, buddy, how fun for that?